Good morning. Hello. Welcome. My name is Pam Hart, and I am the executive director at the Center for Animal Law Studies. And we are here today on day two of the 27th Annual Animal Law Conference, which is being co-hosted by the Animal Legal Defense Fund, the Center for Animal Law Studies, as well as the Lewis and Clark Animal Legal Defense Fund student chapter. And I am thrilled to be here with you this morning to introduce our first speaker, Joyce Tischler. A few things about Joyce for those of you who don't know her. Joyce joined Lewis and Clark Law School as a professor of practice in May 2019. Prior to that, she was an adjunct professor at Lewis and Clark Law School since 2011. She's also taught at the University of California, Davis, John Marshall Law School, JFK Law School, and has lectured at law schools throughout the US. Given her pivotal role in launching the field we now know as animal law, Joyce is affectionately referred to as the mother of animal law. She has been a trailblazer in the field of animal law for more than 40 years and has dedicated her career to improving the lives of animals through the legal system. She is internationally recognized for her work and speaks across the globe on issues germane to animal protection. In 1979, Joyce founded the Animal Legal Defense Fund, the first nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting animals through the legal system. There she conceived of and litigated cutting edge cases aimed at protecting the lives of animals and the interests of animals. Through her intelligence, tenacity, and vision, Joyce has paved the way for all of us through a legal system that routinely ignores the interests of animals. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Joyce. <laughs> and the apple box is back. Good morning. Um, it's midnight in Beijing, which gives you a clue as to how I'm feeling at the moment. Um, I've been asked to open the conference by describing the current legal status of animals. Animals are property. Thank you and enjoy the conference. <laughs> okay, that's, that's the starting point and we are transforming that status how? Well, as it happens, the animal law movement has been hard at work for the last 40 years, and we've been doing many things. We have not been sitting around eating vegan bonbons. In the area of wildlife prote protection, we, has, we have often had to rely on environmental laws, which are very strong and helpful. National Environmental Policy Act, Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Wild Horse and Burroughs Act, and we have challenged hunting and trapping, the destruction of wildlife habitat, and more recently, uh, creative luring has enabled us to extend the Endangered Species Act to cover captive wildlife, wildlife who are in uh, roadside zoos and in terrible situations and suffering greatly. In the area of wills and trusts, we've made unexpected, surprising major strides. Who knew? Sleepy little area of wills and trusts. But we had advised years ago, we, I'm sorry, I'm saying we and its Animal Legal Defense Fund, had advised the drafters of the, revi of the commissions revising the Uniform Probate Code and the Uniform Trust Code so that today, trusts, which used to be honorary, are now enforceable and valid, trusts for animals, and these are pet trusts or animal trusts, and that's really exciting. That has moved the peanut forward substantially. When we relate to companion animals, there are two ways that we work on behalf of companion animals. One is the civil sphere. Uh, the civil sphere means tort law, okay, bringing causes of action bringing cases to challenge, or rather to, to, to um, yeah, to challenge, let's say, uh, people who have uh, done tortious acts, either intentionally or negligently, against animals. If the animal is injured or killed, first you have to prove that the animal, that that was 
caused by the by the tortfeasor, but the much more difficult thing to do is to is to get a court to agree that that animal's life or injuries are worth more than the market value of the animal, and that's where animal lawyers have really been pushing the peanut. Uh, they have been representing owners and have used a variety of creative legal theories, including oh inherent value, intrinsic value, sentimental value. Uh, efforts to use emotional distress. Sometimes they've been successful, sometimes not so, especially in the area of negligent infliction of emotional distress. But they're making progress. They're making great progress. Um, and the idea is to make it more expensive for the tortfeasor to hurt animals as a way of increasing the value of the animal's life. In the criminal sphere, you're going to hear from experts on the surprising ways in which state anti-cruelty laws have been used to protect animals and the significant progress that they have been making, both to strengthen these anti-cruelty laws in the legislative sphere and to hold animal abusers accountable for their crimes. Um, we now have felony provisions in anti-cruelty laws across the country. We have cost of care bonds. There's been great improvement in these laws. And uh, through the work of Animal Legal Defense Fund, there has been partnering with prosecutors and now trainings of prosecutors and judges. And it's a very exciting area of animal law. In the area of scientific research and testing, we experienced, over a period of about two decades, we experienced extreme frustration trying to apply the Federal Animal Welfare Act, uh, which doesn't have a citizen suit provision. So we spent about a decade just arguing about standing in the DC circuit until finally one person in the US was found to have standing under the Animal Welfare Act to challenge uh, abuse of animals, not in research labs, but in, in uh, zoos, in roadside zoos, uh, which would apply to research labs. While we failed to make progress to, to protect animals in research labs, and I don't, I don't consider it our failure, I consider it our society's intransigence, that those cases, those lawsuits and the demonstrations and everything else that was done have, have pushed the dial. Um, litigation helped keep the pressure um, and what has really changed um, what's happening with research in animals is the technological advancements that have been made cell cultures, tissue cultures, mathematical models, computer models, organ on a chip, all of that has come about as a result of, of just technological innovation. And those technological innovations are going to replace the use of animals in toxicity testing and hopefully uh, significantly decrease the number of animals used in research per se. Farmed animals has been an area that's been particularly difficult for us to address because there is no federal law that covers farmed animals while they are being raised. There is zero, nothing. And that shows the power of the meat, egg, and dairy industries that they have been able to control both Congress and the state legislatures. There's no federal law that protects these animals for the 99% of the time they're being raised. State anti-cruelty laws, do offer protections in those states, those 25% of the states that have not specifically exempted farmed animals or customary, customary and standard procedures done to them. So we live in a land where there's very, very little law when it comes to farmed animals. What has changed that? has been the initiative referendum process in the legislatures, or actually outside the legislatures, where citizens were given the ability to vote. And citizens have voted very strongly to ban battery cages, ban veal crates, ban sow crates. And that has given the meat industry a strong message that the consumers want change. There have been lawsuits um, for farmed animals, but they've all been very indirect because we don't have law to enforce. So we have used environmental laws such as the Clean Water Act and the Research Conservation and Recovery Act, which governs uh, the disposal of toxic and, and solid waste. Because as we know, what comes out of these facilities, these factories, is a lot of solid waste and a lot of liquid waste as well. We've also seen the rise of nuisance lawsuits, such as the 26 
nuisance lawsuits that are now occurring in the state of North Carolina against Smithfield and Murphy Brown for what's coming out of those facilities, those hog facilities. The neighbors, the people who have lived near these facilities long before the facilities were built, are suffering from health problems and the devaluation of their homes. And so now they're fighting back and it's, it's looking very good. So far, um, the juries that have, that have um, sat in those cases have given significant damages awards. And again, it says to industry, we want you to take responsibility for the harm that you do. And we've used consumer protection laws, such as those laws prohibiting misleading advertising, false advertising, and misleading labeling. And those have been helpful in, in challenging uh, what's called factory farming, or what I call industrial animal ag. Interestingly, disasters have given us an opportunity to help protect animals better. After uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, we saw Congress pass the Pets Act, uh, which mandated that when, when developing disaster plans, um, officials have to include provisions for our companion animals so that they are not left behind as they were in Hurricane Katrina. You're going to hear from a panel that is exploring efforts to create direct legal rights for animals. Because everything I've talked about up till now is protection and indirect rights, if you want to call them that. But this panel is going to talk about the work of the, uh, the Non-Human Rights Project uh, and in, in the application of habeas corpus and ALDF's uh, use of criminal law theories to develop victims' rights. And that's going to be a fascinating panel. In the area, once you leave litigation and legislation and all of that work on the ground, then we get to academia, where the animal law movement shines very brightly. We have made deep inroads and significant promise, progress. We have established animal law classes in around 165 law schools, moving target there, to give or take. Um, there are animal law student chapters at, what, 200? 202 we're up to, 202 American law schools have animal law chapters, which is amazing, incredible, and keep, keep doing it, you guys. Keep, keep forming those chapters and keeping them alive because they are, they are very important. We have written case books and readers and law review articles and developed law reviews such as Animal Law Review here at Lewis and Clark. Randy Abadi, I, I know, is somewhere and he has um, edited a wonderful book called What Animal Law Can Learn from Environmental Law. Uh, Steve Wise, as we know, has written several books, including Rattling the Cage and Drawing the Line, and has drawn international attention to animal law and animal rights. He has drawn in, and we have drawn in, constitutional law scholars such as Martha Nussbaum, Cass Sunstein, and Lawrence Tribe, and they are now discussing and debating whether animals should have legal rights. And then we've also seen the growth of opposition to animal rights and sometimes animal protection. I call that the three Richards, Richard Posner, Richard Epstein, and Richard Cup. And I'll use their full names rather than, than uh, their nicknames. Um, at CALS, we have the most extensive animal law curriculum in the world with two clinics, the conference annually, the Animal Law Review, the LLM program that, that draws students from countries all over the world. At Harvard, they're trying to catch up and they now have an animal law and policy program um, where, they, where they put on really impressive scholarly gatherings. They have a new animal law and policy clinic. They offer fellowships and uh, are doing wonderful academic work there. There is the growth of international animal law, um, which is one of, I think, the more exciting developments. Animal law may have started here in the U.S., but it's, it, it's no longer just here. Uh, it has spread in every direction and to every continent, and it is now a global phenomenon. And that's all I'm going to tell you. With that thumbnail sketch, this conference is going to take you on a magical mystery tour of the progress that has been made and the 
and it's going to point you in the direction of what can be done next. As I keep saying, I'm, I'm the old timer, part of the first generation of animal law. Uh, we built a foundation. Your job, no pressure, is to take that to the next level. Uh, just don't screw it up, okay? continue building this movement, continue making progress, continue working to transform the legal status of animals, and please never lose faith that you can create a better world for our animal friends. Thank you and good morning.